Well, there are many things about being a dad that I love, I and mean, just so many different blessings and benefits. But one of them, I didn't really know how much I would enjoy it until I actually had kids and was able to use it. And it's that time when your kids begin to talk about something and you're able to say, well, back in my day, it was much harder. I love doing that as a dad. I didn't know I would love it that much, but I love talking about how hard it was back in, in my day. Like I was driving Trenton home from baseball practice and you know, I would just call somebody and I just hit the button on the phone and I say the name and it calls it. And Trenton's like, oh, that's really cool. And I'm like, Trenton, did you know back in my day, you had to memorize those numbers. Those numbers had to be up here, right? I'm trying to tell him that. Or even like he had a, a, a pizza party after his baseball game and we had never been to this pizza place before. So what do we do? You just type it into the phone and it's, the navigation's gonna get you there. But I could tell him back in my day, we used Thomas Guide. You guys remember Thomas Guide? Oh, man, just that large, just massive map. And you'd lay that out over the dashboard. And it's like playing Where's Waldo, trying to find out where you are. And you're trying to maneuver and navigate and turn the map the way that you're heading in that sense. That's what we, that's what we did. Back in my day, it was much, much harder to do. But those apps are out there now. There's so many different ones of them. There's Apple Maps, Google Maps, Waze, a whole bunch of different apps that are trying to get you to the, the destination, the shortest distance possible. And I was reading an article about that, that actually they're trying to make it, you know, in a, in a much speedier, more efficient uh, way to get you to where you want to go. But the fact is that because there's so many different one of these apps, that it's actually creating more traffic jams in areas that aren't designed to hold traffic jams. Because all of these different apps are trying to route you to these different navigation areas so that it's a shorter distance. Because there's so many different apps competing against each other, now these small, tiny streets are all being uh, crowded and directed because all these apps are directing them down these back roads to try to make things go faster, but they're actually holding them up. So I was reading the article, and here's what the, the, the final thing that the author said, and I thought it was insightful. He said, on, on top of all the different problems that this will face, the fact that all these apps are out for themselves will not allow this problem to be solved. Because these apps aren't designed to work together. Each app wants to be the superior app, and they're not going to sit down and go, okay, how can we now solve this problem so we're all getting the same thing? They all want the users to come to them. They want it to be the best app. And so the fact that they're all out for themselves will really stop them from ever solving this problem. And I thought about that. That's a great phrase. The fact that all of them are out for themselves will stop them. I think that's the same thing in the church. If you had a group of people who came to church and they were all out for themselves, they didn't care about somebody else, they didn't think what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, they didn't consider the call of making disciples and how you need a group of people to do that, nothing would ever get accomplished. But think about the great things that God can do if we did depend on one another and we did what the scripture said, and we, we were all banded together in a bond of unity with the same goal, moving towards the same end, how incredible that could be. That's what we want to talk about today as we're moving along in our final segment of this discipleship series. What it means to have a unified goal and what it means to have a unified group that are progressing towards the same ends. And when you do that together, God does just these incredible things. But at the beginning of this, remember, I started to talk about one of the reasons why we were bringing discipleship up is because there are those people who will come into a group like this and they will look like externally they are a part of the group and they're about what the group is about. But ultimately they fall away or they apostatize because they profess the faith but they didn't possess it. And the Bible and the New Testament constantly are showing that that amongst the people of God, there can be those people who merely profess, but don't possess the faith that genuinely saves and transforms. And if we're going out and making disciples, we need to make sure that we understand what real, genuine saving faith is. Why don't you turn to an example with me in John chapter six, just so we set the stage rightly. If we're going out and proclaiming a gospel of salvation by grace through faith, we wanna make sure we're talking about the right faith. And it's the faith that genuinely saves. And when you possess that and not profess it, it's the right faith. The New Testament is constantly giving this, and I think we see an example of that in John 6, verses 60 to 71. John chapter 6, verses 60 to 71. Follow along as I read. It says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but 
There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who were those who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said to them, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Now, do you see that category? There's this group of people, they're called disciples, they're amongst the 12 disciples and other legitimate disciples who are professing the right faith in Jesus Christ, but now Jesus goes, you're calling yourself a disciple, but you don't really believe the way the Bible says genuine saving faith comes. You have an intellectual agreement with what's going on, you've, you've tracked with what I've said and so far that's working for you, but now that I'm saying something that you don't like, you're leaving and you don't wanna do what I'm asking you to do. Look at verse 66. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. That's what we don't want. That's not what we're aiming for. I'm not just sitting down with somebody in this uh, effort to make a disciple and just get them to merely intellectually agree with what I'm saying and then move on and think that my job is done. No, real saving faith is something that you possess and it begins to transform you and that transformation happens in the realm of discipleship. I'm not gonna be satisfied with somebody who will just parrot off some words. They have to have that real faith. Look at verse 67. And Jesus said to the 12 then, his disciples, do you wanna go away as well? Listen to Peter's great answer here. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, do you see the distinctions in those two different confessions? You have the, the first group that are disciples, and they're disciples because they've mentally assented to something, but now that something's not agreeing with that, they're gonna turn around and they're gonna walk away, but the disciples of Jesus are those who look to him and believe him and trust him in his character and his word and know who he truly is, and that's a possession that can never be taken from you. We're not just into professions. We want the real possession of saving faith. Maybe a good way to think about it would be this. I told you a few weeks ago, I think in a sermon, uh, of a TV show called Flinch. It's on Netflix. You can watch it. It's entertaining. And the whole point of the game is they put you through these just weird ideals and weird situations to try to get you to flinch. And if you flinch, you lose the game. So here's one of them, straight out of a nightmare. Okay, they sit you in a chair and they pop your head up through this little thing that has this wired uh, covering over you. And it's connected to two long tubes so that they can, uh, access, things can access you. And then they take a piece of cheese and they stick it right in front of your nose. And then they release rats to come down the, the pipe. And what you have to do is let the rats eat the cheese without you flinching. You just have to sit there and not flinch at all. It is a nightmare, so if you're afraid of rats, then I wouldn't watch the show, but that's the type of weird things that they do in that, in that show. But they have this other one, okay, where they sit a person in a chair, and on the opposite side of them, they have a washing machine suspended midair from pipes and poles, and I don't, you don't see the behind the scenes, but you know something like this has to happen. The producer and director of the show is gonna come out and gonna explain the game to the person. Listen, you're sitting in this chair, and this washing machine is designed to be dropped and to go right over your face. We promise you, it's not gonna hit you. We swear on everything, we've tested it, we've had it checked, this is not gonna break. Your job is to sit in the chair and when the button's pressed, to sit there and watch that and not flinch at all. So you have two groups of people. You have the one group that's gonna flinch. They're there and they hear that coming from the director. They hear the words, the instructions, they understand it, they agree with what's going on, but when the time comes for it to happen, the button presses, what do they do? They start freaking out and flinching because they've intellectually agreed, I understand what you've just told me, but when it comes to the rubber meets the road, they're gonna do everything in their power to try to save themselves because they didn't really trust what was said. But you will also see a group that because they've believed the character and word of the director, and they know that it won't hit them, although there might be some internal consternation there, they're able to sit there and rest peacefully as it goes right over their face. That is faith that has changed a person, that they're acting on what they really believe. They trust the person so much that has told them this won't hurt them, you're in good hands, just, I promise you. Is that the Allstate line, you're in good hands with Allstate? Yeah, I don't, I don't trust me, you're, you're in the right place, we've done everything, you're gonna be okay, you have to believe me. That's the difference between saving faith and just merely professing a faith. 
That's what the New Testament is constantly distinguishing. Isn't that what James 2 is all about? James 2 is not a discussion between does works save you and faith save you? It's a discussion between what is real faith? He says, what is the type of faith that can save you? Is it a faith that when it comes in, it does nothing to the person? Or is it a faith that comes in and exercises itself through works? That's what it means to have real saving faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings you in to the realm of discipleship. To see this, let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Look me to Matthew 11. This brings you into the realm of discipleship. When you trust someone else and you believe in them and you don't try to do it yourself, that's where real saving faith comes from. Matthew chapter 11. Let's take a look at verses 28 and 29. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Just some of the most famous verses, great verses in all the scripture. Listen to Jesus' words here. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can you imagine just being in the the group of people that heard that originally? That in the context where they're taught, what you do saves you. How you act saves you. That's what that Judaistic teaching was going to do. How you earn your status, your justification, your forgiveness before God is to follow these burdensome commands. And when you do so, God will then owe you salvation. That is a heavy burden that no human being can ever bear. And now Jesus comes and says, if you're burdened like that, come to me. And you're going to find rest because I'm going to take that on. I'm going to live the perfect life. I'm going to die the death, which was the punishment for your sins. And I'm going to rise again three days later to give you new life in Jesus Christ. If you simply believe, rest in me. You're you're trusting Jesus' words that he's told you the right thing so that when the rubber meets the road, you don't try to do anything to save yourself. You are trusting that Jesus is the one who has done that for you. But did you notice how Jesus said it in here? Take my yoke upon you, and here's the phrase, and learn from me. So again, when we talk about resting in Jesus for salvation, that doesn't mean we just live this peaceful and unaffected life for the rest of our lives. There's the discipleship process that comes because Jesus is using this word, learn from me, which is the word that the apostle Paul has used over and over again in the New Testament that I've been trying to show you. Listen, that just because Paul doesn't call the Christians disciples, he's using this verb form of a disciple to show you that's how he does ministry. Jesus is calling the same thing. When you come to me and you believe in me, you're going to learn from me and I'm going to train you to be a disciple. I hope that connection has been good for you because we've been trying to say that the same way Jesus has been saying to make disciples is the same way the New Testament epistles has been trying to say, this is how you make disciples. And we're looking at the verb form over and over again. And that's the same verb form that we have right here. In fact, if you want to just another reference in Paul, write down Colossians 1.7. Colossians 1.7 will match what Jesus says here. Colossians 1.7, Paul's talking to the church at Colossae and he's just giving them this great praise because they've been instructed in the grace of God. They've learned what the gospel is from Epaphroditus. And it says this phrase, just as you learned it from Epaphroditus and understood the grace of God in truth. And that verb for learn is the same word that Jesus has here. So ministry and discipleship is always this process of investing learning into people who then learn it and make it their own and then pass it on to the generation that comes after them. That's what this discipleship process has always been. New Testament gospels, New Testament epistles as well. Can we ask the question for a second? If Jesus has said here that I'm going to give you rest and salvation, then why the journey of discipleship afterwards? I mean, if you've been with us in the gospel of Mark, you know that there are hard times that comes. You you read the New Testament epistles. There are trials that will come upon you. So if you've been given this rest in Christ, what is with the extreme arduous journey that comes with discipleship? Because you could go to Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew 16 is going to be the same thing we've heard in Mark already, which is deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That's coming from the same Jesus that just says, if you come to me, I'm going to give you rest. Why is there this, this arduous call to discipleship? Let me see if I can help you think through that. Put Mount Everest in your mind for a moment. Okay, think about Mount Everest. And I think if you take the the southern route to the top, there are five camps and then there's the top. So think about a 
two people. There's one person on the ground who is going to get to the top. He's going to get uh, helicoptered from there. One person has done that in all of history, has been from the bottom of base camp, and they've helicoptered all the way to the top. Some German name I can't pronounce, but he made it to the top, and he went from the bottom to the top just simply by going on a helicopter. So one person's going to do that to get to the top, and then this person over here is going to actually climb Mount Everest. Let me ask you the question. When they both get to the top, let's say they both arrive at the same time, the guy gets the head start, he goes, he gets up there, and then this guy helicopters up there. When they get to the top, who enjoys the top more? Is it the person who got helicoptered up there, really did nothing, it was just kind of easy for him, somebody lifted him up there and he put up there. Is he really going to enjoy his experience at the top as much as somebody who's gone on the entire journey? To me, I think it would be the person who's gone up on the journey because he's really understood just how significant this mountain is and the difficulties that have come through it. The fact that he's made it to the top is just going to be an incredible blessing to him. And I think there's something to that in the way that Jesus, after granting us this rest and this salvation in Christ, calls us to go on this journey of discipleship because when we get to the end and we realize, like we talked about last time, that we made it to the top by his grace and his grace alone, And because we were with a group of people who loved us more than they loved themselves and we're all celebrating at the top together, there will be a greater enjoyment, a greater understanding of the the magnitude of that salvation because of the journey that you went through. In fact, that's probably a good thing for us to think as we're we're gonna try to encapsulate what discipleship is. Let's think about it this way. We're gonna learn the final two G's today. So we've had gospel and glory which are those bookends to what discipleship is. The gospel that has saved you by grace through faith that has to become our primary proclamation as we progress in our likeness to Jesus Christ. And we await that glory. We cannot wait to be there. The experience that we're gonna have when we get in his presence and we've gone through the journey is gonna be an incredible, incredible privilege. But last time we talked about the grace of God that is necessary to empower us to cause us to endure through that long journey to the top. So that when we get to the top, we realize, like Jesus said, apart from him, we could have done nothing. But now through his grace, we have gone through this incredible journey and we give him more glory at the end when we reach the top. Now today, we want to talk about maintaining the right goal and having the right group of people around you. Because without having the right goal to get to the top, you can get distracted by very many things on the journey. And if you don't have the right group, you are susceptible to a whole bunch of temptations. And I think both of these show up in the Gospel of Mark. Why don't you turn with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Hope that you guys see these connections. It's very important. I think we're going to the Gospel of Mark for a specific reason. I want to tell you guys where you're turning there, why we're going to Mark, and we're pulling all of these G's from the Gospel of Mark and these ideas of discipleship. One is because we've worked our way systematically you know, to expository teaching, looking at all the the passages of scripture in context. So now as I reference them, I'm not, I'm not trying to pull something that you don't know we haven't already studied in context. So if you disagree with the application, you just go back and see if it was anything different than what we presented in those texts earlier. Because if we were just go to a different book of the Bible and just start pulling ones, you could say, well, is that in context? But we've done that in Mark already. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing it. But secondly, think about the gospel of Mark itself. So we've got four gospels. How do each one of them begin? They begin very differently than Mark. See, Matthew starts with a genealogy. It's going to prove Jesus' line to the Messiah. Luke, again, begins with the beginning narrative of Jesus and his birth. And then chapter 3 gets into the, the whole genealogy. And John has that amazing Christology at the beginning, talking about the word with God and the word was God. And it was all happening before the foundation of the world. But Mark doesn't have that. Mark is immediately into the action over and over again. And I agree with the scholars who say Mark's purpose in writing this is to send it to the Christians who are in Rome to give them a discipleship document. This is what Jesus says making disciples is all about. And you get that from the get-go. Because as soon as we're introduced to John the Baptist, he tells us who Jesus is. Okay, this is the Messiah. He's coming to make disciples. And then bam, Peter, James, John, Andrew, they're getting called to become disciples. And then he's showing his Messiahship, but he's teaching his disciples along the way. So the Gospel of Mark is really this this paradigm for us that if we're going to do what the Bible's telling us to do, we can follow directly. And we have it here in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. I want to talk about the goal. 
What is the goal of, this, of a disciple as he's living? And calling the crowd to him, verse 34, with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man if he would gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father with his holy angels. So this is talking about the call of the disciple, what their aim and goal is and what it should be throughout their entire life. So why don't you write it down with me, number one, this way on your outline. If we're going to be about the business of making disciples, we need to aim at the unified goal. We need to aim at the unified goal. We don't want to be um, directionless as we're moving up the mountain. We need to make sure that we are climbing this mountain empowered by the grace of God to do it all for the honor and glory of God and to aim at the right goal, which I think is being taught to us here. In fact, let's, let's make sure we clarify this because we're not saying again that the journey of discipleship, you become a disciple after you've endured enough to become a disciple. That's not what we're saying. So, so think about it in terms of me. Let's just think about a climb of Everest, Okay. Let's just picture Jesus at base camp. This is how discipleship starts. Jesus must climb Everest by himself and do it all perfectly in your place, go up and down, back to base camp before discipleship can ever happen. That's the substitutionary life and death of Jesus. He accomplishes it and comes back down. But when Jesus gets down at that first base camp, this is what he sees. He sees a sea of dead bodies, just people who are dead and can do nothing to save themselves. So Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. Jesus comes and breathes lives into these corpses at base camp. Now that they've been given life, he calls them to be the disciples who follow him up to the top of the mountain that he has already conquered. And now you understand that discipleship is not earning your salvation, but because you've been granted salvation in the gospel, you are enabled to come climb that mountain with him. And so to put the G in that we talked about last time, the, the grace of God, know that when you climb Mount Everest, you can't really do it on your own oxygen and strength. People who climb it, they, they have supplemental oxygen. Because as you get further up the mountain, the oxygen is less and you become very, very susceptible to death. So at base camp, what Christ does is he puts this uh, unending supply of supplemental oxygen on your back with a mask that you always have access to. That is the grace of God that we were talking about last time, without which you would not be able to endure all the way up the mountain. It's a, it's a power given to you outside yourself. And so now you're able to endure as you follow Jesus up the mountain, the mountain that he's already conquered, because you have this supplemental oxygen, which would be the grace of God that has strengthened you. But let's say you're doing that with a group of people. You have the supplemental oxygen, the strength of the grace of God. You've been saved by the gospel. You're heading towards glory. What is the goal of what you're trying to accomplish as you move from camp to camp to get to the top? And Jesus says it for us right here. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Living for the sake of Christ now becomes the goal of the disciple. So everything I do is not about me and having attention be pulled on me, and having concern be pulled on me, but I'm now throwing everything I have on the attention and glory of another. I'm living for the sake of another person. And so my actions are now not my own. They have been bought with a price, to quote the Apostle Paul. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm going to glorify God with my body. That's the goal of discipleship, that I would renounce my autonomy, and I would move in the direction of Christ, following him up this mountain for the sake and glory of Christ's name. That's what we want to talk about. And I think that's the point that you see here, and it's very clearly laid out for us in Mark chapter 10. Just go over two chapters to see this. Go over two chapters to see this. Mark chapter 10, it's the story of the rich young ruler. So remember how the rich young ruler came up. The rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and he wants to be led into the kingdom of God, not through repentance and faith, not through dependence upon the gospel, not having Christ save him, but he says, accept me because I've done things. This is who I am. Here's my status as the rich young ruler. This is what I've done. Welcome me into the kingdom because of me and what I've done. And Jesus says, that's not what it's about. 
In fact, he says it to him at the end of verse 21. After he said, teacher, I've kept all these commandments from my youth. So the implicit thing is, accept me into your kingdom based on this goodness. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and wanted him to know the way to get into heaven and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. See, he refused to live for the sake of Christ. He was driven by and devoted to something else, the possessions that he had. This is what I'm gonna make all my decisions on. This is how I base my life. This is how I base my worth. This is where I find my identity. This is everything about me, my great possessions and my status in this community. And I'm not willing to renounce that for your sake. I'm gonna live for my sake and my sake alone. So he walked away sad. But notice what Peter and the disciples say. They said, Jesus said to his disciples, how difficult then will it be for someone who has wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And his disciples were amazed at the word, but Jesus said to him, Children, how difficult, is it for the, uh, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus says, with man it's impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, see, watch this, we have left everything and followed you. So this is that real genuine belief that realizes that if I'm resting in Christ and Christ alone, that's a renouncing of everything that I have in my status to simply live for the sake of Christ. And that's what Jesus says. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So it's a renunciation, not simply for the, pe- the fact to show that we in and of ourselves can just say no to the pleasures of the world and therefore we're old salvation. No, that's not why you do it. You say no to the temptations of the world or no to building your status or your platform so people look at you. You live for the sake of Christ because you realize the worthiness of Christ. To, po- to quote Paul from Philippians chapter one, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value, Philippians three, sorry, of knowing Christ Jesus. My Lord, it's for the sake of Christ that you live. So now we want to say, if that's the the goal of what the Christian lives for, I live for the glory of another, the fame of another, the sake of another, is that what the New Testament epistles teach? Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians, we said, Philippians 4, 9, Paul says, what you've learned from me, that verb form of disciple shows us that Paul taught in this ministry, this is the way you're gonna make disciples and disciples need to look the way that Paul taught and did Paul teach the same way as Jesus? Philippians chapter one, look at verses 21 to 26. Philippians one, verses 21 to 26. Do we see the same idea as Jesus? Look at verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see the same thing that Jesus was saying? You renounce everything for my sake. I'm the one who's worthy to be followed. What does Paul say? For me to live, Christ. There's really no verb there. It's just for me to live, Christ. To die, gain. Why? Because if I die, he says, if I live on the flesh, it's fruitful labor. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ. I want to get to the glory. That's far better than it is here. But to remain on in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know I will remain on and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. But is Paul teaching the same goal as Jesus was? Yeah, absolutely. You lose your life for the sake of Christ here. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's nothing else. There's nothing else that I'm living for, nothing else that drives me, nothing else that I want other than to see Christ glorified. Maybe another way to say it, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 to uh, 33. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 to 33. 1 Corinthians 10, 
31 to 33, says this. So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Chapter 10 has been, been, been about the right worship. You can't worship with those who are worshiping uh, idols. You don't want to have fellowship with those people. You have fellowship with people who want to do what I'm telling you to do. And the type of people you have fellowship with is, are those who do everything, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage. So that now be, becomes the, the clear fight that we struggle with in the Christian life. I'm living for the sake of Christ and not living for my own advantage. Those are the two things that are going to be in battle here on earth on this arduous journey of discipleship is that we at times default to thinking we're the most important person. But if we have the right goal for the sake of Christ, now we understand the point of the journey. I'm, I'm living for Jesus. And if I do it that way, then what happens? I'm doing it for the many that they may be saved. Salvation comes when we really live out the faith that we say that we have. And we're able to proclaim a, a gospel to people and show them this is what salvation is all about. You get to live for Christ who has loved you. How did Paul say in Galatians 2.20? The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You've been given this new life. You now do it for Christ. And how did Paul learn this? Take a look at verse 11. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This is the discipleship process. The teacher, the master, the leader teaches the students. Students striving together to be like the savior who saved them. That definition of discipleship that we've given is seen right here. Be imitators of me. Why? Not because Paul's so great and he came up with it, but because he's looked at Christ and said, oh, this is the way Christ says ministry should happen. So let's do what Christ did and follow the way that Jesus taught his followers to fall. Now think about this. Just go back to that image of walking up Mount Everest. Here's the temptation that we have to get so enamored with the journey and not the destination. Like if you were on a climb for Mount Everest and you were a group of unified people with the same goal, you wouldn't have a lot of trouble if somebody in the group went a little rogue and said, hey guys, we got to this first base camp. Let's just stop the journey right here. Let's just really try to make this base camp the best base camp that it can be. We're going to try to build up some new walls. We'll try to get heaters. We'll try to bring in all the things we can to make this the best place. And we're going to stay right here. If we all had the same goal, we go, no, we didn't start this journey just to get here and to invest here. We're going on this journey to get to there. So our investment should not be with just the here and now, but we're looking for the then and there. We want to be unified in the same purpose and having that same purpose for the sake of Christ to, to be where glory is, is what we should be doing. And that's going to happen when we don't live for our sake. We live for the sake of Christ. That's how God designed humanity to be. I hope you remember that. Being made in the image of God, God designed you to spread his image throughout the world so he'd get glory. You guys remember that a few years ago? I gave that illustration at uh, Easter. It's been very helpful to me just to think about the way that I should live my life each and every day. It was the idea I told you of a walking billboard. Remember that? I think it was two Easter's ago. And what I told you was there was competition in the 70s between the two shoe companies, Nikes and Adidas, and they were trying to gain supremacy. And what they did was they, they said, we got to market, we got to get our image out there so people see it and they know us and we become the number one brand. So what happened in the podcast that I was listening to is they began to try all these marketing strategies and one of them came up with, well, if we just pick athletes and we get our image on those athletes, it's going to spread that image everywhere and we're going to be number one. So they did image saturation by putting their image on athletes who were winning gold medals and being the best in their sports. So people look at those athletes and now they associate the best with that image and they called those athletes walking billboards. That's what humanity is for God. We're to be a walking billboard promoting his glory, his goal, his agenda, and not ours. And in Christ, we've been given that power to now be able to accomplish that fact, which we couldn't apart from that saving faith. So God has given us this goal and opportunity in discipleship to fulfill what we were always created for, living for the glory of another, for the sake of another, to live as Christ and to die as gain. But I think the final question that we need to ask is, can you do that alone? Is that something you could accomplish by yourself? Is all this stuff that we've been speaking about discipleship, is it, is it possible for you to say, I'm just going to kind of do my own thing? I, you, know, you know those people, those brainiacs whenever you would go to school. I was not one of them. I don't need to study with a group. 
I need to study by myself, and I'm gonna go ace the test the next day? Or do you need that, that study group? Well, if you notice, the way that we've defined our discipleship is students. We've always said it plural. Students striving to be like the Savior who saved them. Because I think the Bible is teaching that you cannot do this individually. And if you try to pursue it individually, you will utterly fail in that sense. Let's write this down number two on your outline this way. Final G is the group that you're with. So we need to grow with a unified group. We need to be united in a unified goal. We need to grow with a unified group. It becomes so necessary for us to have the right group of people around us. And God in his wisdom has made sure that that's how discipleship is going to function. Now let's ask the question, is, is that just something Pastor Elliot's saying? Or is that something that the scriptures are saying? Let's go to Mark chapter three. Think about this with Mark chapter three. Is this the way Jesus taught his disciples to act in community? You know something interesting while you're turning there? Mark chapter three. In the gospel of Mark, did you know this? That the singular, ver, the singular word disciple does not appear. The only time that disciple appears is when it's in the plural, disciples. The other gospels do have individual disciples being spoken to and this is what a disciple does. But Mark is an incredible different animal by itself. The only time that you see the word disciple is when it's in the plural. So it's always disciples, disciples, disciples. So you're thinking there in the plural already with the way that Jesus is doing things. If you remember in chapter six, when he sends the disciples out, how does he send them out? Individual to go do it? No, he does it two by two because he realizes that there's power and strength in the community. So Jesus is, is always promoting this discipleship. In fact, I can really only think of the few times in Mark where there's just a focus on a single disciple. They're doing something bad. You know, Peter rebuking Christ or Judas betraying Jesus. It's when they're acting on their own that they're really doing these foolish things. But when they're in community, they have a, an opportunity to do what um, Christ is asking them to do. But at the end of chapter 3, we understand why Jesus is always promoting this group mindset. Chapter 3, verses 31 to 35. Watch this. And he said, uh, oh, and his mother and brothers came and they were standing outside and they sent to him and called to him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat at the table with him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So he begins to talk about, he begins to talk about discipleship in family language. And that was the same thing that we saw at the end of the rich young ruler. If you leave, Everything in this life, for my name's sake, you're going to gain hundreds of mothers, hundreds of brothers, hundreds of houses, hundreds of sisters. There is a community that is going to come around you because discipleship has to happen in the power of community. And if you think you could do that on your own, you are going to be woefully disappointed when you come up against obstacles that you will not be able to overcome. They will be insurmountable for you if you approach them alone. But they will be possible to be accomplished if you go at them in community. So now we should ask the question then, is this the same thing that Paul was teaching in the New Testament epistles? And I think so again, let's go back to Philippians. Philippians chapter one. I love this, this passage and this connection that you see in Philippians one. Philippians chapter one. Take a look with me. One, 27 and 28. Philippians one, 27 and 28. Watch what he says here, 127 to 28. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, here's the phrase, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. See, that's what you have to have if you're gonna progress as a disciple. People that you strive side by side with. If I can just be you know, open and honest with you, telling tell you about the trials that my family's been through in the past couple of months. Just how devastating that would have been if I didn't have people around me who cared for me. You know, you guys have been so kind to text or to pray or to offer counsel or do all these different things. And so to get to where we are, to be able to stand and say, God's in control of all this, doesn't happen by yourself. It happens when you have people around you who really care the way that the Bible says so. More than they care for themselves, they, they care for other people. And that's the way that God has designed his family to function in that sense. If you've gone through a trial and you've made it through, you know that to be true. 
you know that you didn't grit up and endure it by yourself. There were people around you who cared for you, who helped you, who supported you, who loved you, because that's the way discipleship happens. You are striving side by side with somebody. Do you guys understand that's why there's so much call in the New Testament for unity? Because if disunity and disruption comes in, then it makes us vulnerable and susceptible to the temptations of the devil. Just flip over to chapter four. Watch this in Philippians. Philippians 4, 2. Philippians 4, 2. Look what Paul says to this. There's a little faction going on in the church. Philippians 4, 2. I entreat Iodia and I entreat Syntyche, watch this, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored, here we go, side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Do you hear the army that Paul has around him? You're my true companion. I got Clement. I got all these other people who are here whose names are written in the book of life because God has saved them by grace. And we all have the same goal because we don't want to live for ourselves. We want to live for the glory of Christ. If there's disunity, please help those people. Watch this phrase, agree in the Lord. I'm really hoping that this week in small groups you have an opportunity to talk about that. That's one of your questions on the back. What does it look like to agree in the Lord? Because if we have that mindset here, it protects us from what the devil wants most among us, which is disunity and disharmony. I was, uh, I was reflecting one day, thinking like, you know, we're in here, Columbus Tustin, you got a bulldog over here. These are the Columbus Tustin Bulldogs. That's their, uh, their mascot. You see a bulldog right there in the middle court. I was like, we don't have a mascot as a church. Maybe we should have a mascot. So I haven't officially chosen it yet, but if we ever have a mascot, you know what it's gonna be? The musk ox. You know what a musk ox is? It's an extremely ugly animal, okay? So just know we're gonna be represented by an extremely ugly animal. It's a big brute of an animal. But the musk ox is such a brilliant character study with what I think the Bible's teaching on having unity. It says, reading this article on National Geographic, and actually the article was focused on these Arctic wolves and the way that they hunt. They tried to get the weak and young parts of the musk, musk oxen, which is the hardest word to say, just so you know, musk oxen. They try to separate and isolate the weak and the small musk oxen so that they can attack them because they know that if they attack the group of oxen together, they're never gonna be able to overcome it. So they do all they can to wait for a young one or a weak one who can't keep up and they're gonna surround them and separate them and then they're gonna pounce and attack. That is the same thing that happens in the church of Jesus Christ. Somebody who is, maybe they're, maybe they're in a sense of pride. I, I, I don't want to be in a community. Maybe they're separating themselves that way. Maybe they've been hurt and we're just not paying attention to them and they're off to the side, but now they're vulnerable. And so what do we need to do? We need to make sure the community's there. Listen to how the article talked about the strength of the community there. It says this, the musk oxen are one of the few prey animals that can work together to form a defensive line to protect their herd's calves and counter the wolves' attacks. Go watch it on YouTube. It's an incredible sight to just watch them you know, circle around those who need protection. And there's these big burly animals. By themselves, they're vulnerable, but together, a strong community. That's why Paul's saying this. Agree in the Lord. Be in the Lord and protect one another. Because if not, you're separating yourselves and you have every chance to be attacked by who? A roaring lion who's seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. What First Peter tells you in that, in that opportunity to glorify God in community. So what do we do? Not only are we protecting one another, but we're teaching one another. Turn to Philippians 3. Watch this. What happens in this community? It's a community where we protect, we care, we love, we have the same goal. And how do we pass on this teaching? Same way that we've seen earlier, Philippians 3, 17. Watch what Paul says here. It says this, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. So Paul brings up the idea of imitation again, which is something that we really have to discuss in the church today. I think it has been the failure of the church in discipleship that we've failed to teach by imitation. We failed to be able to tell people, hey, you can look at me the way the Apostle Paul just said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And as he's calling them, Philippians, you can look at me 
And you can do what I'm doing because I'm following Christ. And you can also look at those who walk according to the example. We've really lost the art of saying, uh, of teaching by imitation. And you know why that's sad? Because we as humans never stop learning by imitation. And if you're a parent out there, you know this with your kids. Because all the bad habits you have. Do you have to teach those to your kids? No. They just simply watch what you do and they pick those things up naturally. But also, they'll pick up those positive things as well as you begin to, to show them. And you begin, parenting and discipleship, they go hand in hand. Why does Paul call himself a father and a mother? The way that you're trying to instruct your kids. Kids, this is the right way to do it. Let me show you how to do it. Now go do it in that sense. Has always been the way that discipleship happens. And Paul's saying that same thing in the community. If you don't care enough about people to live a life worthy enough of the gospel, Philippians 127, you can't call anybody to imitate you. And that's why discipleship slows. It's not that you're trying to be prideful or you're making yourself the the center of attention. You're saying, I want to do what Christ did. And so you imitate me only insofar as I imitate Christ. And that's the standard and example. That's how we pass it on. That's what we want to do constantly. When you do that in a community, now that really materializes and passes on to one another. And you're able to see this, this development happen and that's what the Spirit of God does amongst us. But we gotta have that unified group to do so. To go back to the analogy of just walking up a mountain, I've always, I've always thought this. Again, if we have the Spirit of God or if we're thinking about walking up the mountain, we've been given that unending supply of oxygen that gives us the strength that if we didn't have, we wouldn't be able to make it to the top. Why is it that Christians begin to sin, right? If we always have access to that grace, why is it that we begin to sin? Well, here's what happens. Pride comes in and maybe we we take the mask off and think that we can walk with the group without the mask and without being dependent upon the grace of God and without doing our devotions and without worshiping ourselves. We just take the mask off and you know what you can do? You can walk with the community for a little while there. But the community that keeps its masks on is going to continue to go at the rate of the strength of the grace of God. And you soon, without that strength, are going to slowly lose oxygen. So you're going to go back and you're going to be separated from the group. Really, that's how I'd like you to view accountability. It's not shining a light on somebody to be a police officer in their life. You're just checking to see, have you you taken off the mask and are you separated from the group just put the mask back on. Come, come to the grace of God. Be strengthened. Be a part of the community here. That's what we want you to do. We're not trying to you know, do check marks on if you did this or that. We're just asking, are you breathing in the grace of God to accomplish what he's asking you to do? Because if not, there's no way you can accomplish it. That's what I think these scriptures are saying. And we do that by imitation. Listen, when I went through this trial, this is what I did. Now, you follow this way. Or when I was given this ministry opportunity, watch what I did. I think that's what the scriptures are saying. Let's go do it that way. First Thess chapter 1 says the same thing. You Thessalonian church became imitators of us, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and of the Lord. We're just passing on all that we've learned over and over again, generation to generation, just trying to be faithful and unified for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. I was reading an article about uh, World War II, just how differently it could have ended. See, the Germans were actually, during World War II, working on trying to to build this nuclear bomb, and they actually had like a a huge head start. And what, what would happen if they would have succeeded? Like, would World War II have been much different if the Germans would have had a bomb? And imagine Hitler having a bomb like that and being able to do that. But I was so interested in the article They showed why the Germans failed to put that bomb together. Listen to what they said. Um, The Germans had a two-year head start on this nuclear nuclear technology, but fierce competition over finite resources, bitter interpersonal rivalries, and ineffectual scientific management resulted in significant delays in their progress towards achieving their nuclear reactor. So the Germans failed at that, and praise God they did, because of interpersonal rivalries, ineffectual management, and uh, bitterness over finite resources. I mean, if the church is going to accomplish what God's asking us to do, those categories can't be true of us. We can't have bitterness. We can't have rivalries. That's what stops people from doing that. But unity happens when we have the same goal, same purpose, same focus. We want to live for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. This unity will halt anything. And we want to be unified for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. So I think these six areas are what God has called the church to do in discipleship. 
The question we need to ask ourselves with, are we going to be willing to put ourselves out there to do that? That's the call. When you go out there next week and you stand at that tiller, tiller days booth, are you really thinking, I'm going I'm to try to make a disciple today. By the grace of God, I'm going to share the gospel. I'm going to follow up with that person. We're going to pray for a conversion to happen. And when it does, we're going to rejoice in the glory of God. Do you want to be a part of that? Or would you rather be the person who sits on the sidelines and isn't a part of the community and just kind of acts on his own interests? I don't think the scriptures give you that choice. I think if you're a disciple saved by the grace of God, you want to be involved in that whole process. And so what we need to do as a community is commit to doing that so God gets all the glory he can and the gospel spreads and his name gets all the praise. So I want to go to God right now and ask that he'd give us the strength to do that. Father, it is our privilege and empowered by your glory that we're able to do all that you've called us to do. And God, what a work discipleship is to think that we can grow into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ is an incredible thought to us. Only by the grace of God, which is given to us through the power of the Spirit, does that happen. And Father, we pray that as we are more like Christ, we wouldn't seek our own advantage, but we would seek how we could minister better to others for the sake of the gospel and the glory of Jesus Christ. God, that is difficult in an age and generation that we find ourselves in where it's so easy to get distracted from what we're called to do. But Father, we're not sitting here. We're, we're trying to develop everything here. We're not trying to build sand kingdoms here that are going to be destroyed. We want to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We want to aim for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And God, we can find the, the joy and the, the desire that you've always promised when we follow your word. So God, may we be faithful to do so. Help days like this where we come together to talk about this and where we talk uh, and where we sing from our hearts about the joy that we want to have in you God may that sustain us through the hardest times and Father ultimately we may we see a great harvest of real disciples being made for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ we pray this in his precious name Amen